Hello everyone and welcome to Game Soundtrack FM. In this station you'll hear the best pieces of music the video game genre has to offer, from your favorite childhood memories to the songs that make you laugh, cry and scream in anger. Whether it's the sweet swingy sounds of Fallout, the dramatic action pieces of Call of Duty or the playful joy of Nintendo's music, you'll find everything here. You may ask yourself, why game soundtracks? What's so special about them? Well, let me tell you. First of all, I need you guys to understand how I see video game OSTs. For me, there are three major categories of video game soundtracks. Fully original scores, mixed soundtracks and licensed soundtracks. All three of them have their own strengths and weaknesses and all three can serve very different kinds of players. Fully original scores are soundtracks for games that only, or to a very high degree, have music in them that was specifically written for set game. The Witcher, Assassin's Creed, Anno or The Elder Scrolls are just a few examples here. Original scores allow the composers and game developers to create truly unique and fitting music that carries the atmosphere and the feelings they want the players to feel without spending hours and hours trying to find fitting licensed music by bands or other composers. Mick Gordon's badass Doom soundtrack, Marcin Shubilovich's beautiful Witcher 3 soundtrack and Brian Tyler's daunting Far Cry 3 OST are so different in their styles and show a variety most movie soundtracks wish they had. Mixed soundtracks are usually found in games that include radio stations. The player can oftentimes choose between listening to the OST or the licensed music on the radio. Games like Fallout, GTA 5 or Far Cry 5 all have pretty extensive OSTs, but also allow the player to turn that off and listen to normal music, whether it's in Hope Countries or Los Santos Cars or the Wastelands Pip Boys. These games tend to force the soundtrack onto you at specific points though. Mission accomplished themes or very important and emotional cutscenes are usually supported by a track from the OST, probably to ensure that the player is presented with the best fitting atmosphere. That is a crucial part of a soundtrack scope, but more on that later. The third type are soundtracks completely made up of licensed songs. Sport games like FIFA, Need for Speed or the Tony Hawk's and Skate series usually only have licensed songs from 3 to 4 genres like rock rap or electronic music. Dismissing game soundtracks that only consist of licensed tracks as a cheap way of game development is an appealing idea, but it doesn't do the developers justice at all. And to be honest, I think it is actually harder finding songs that go well with the game's setting and creating music for the game's environment. And if done well, it works like a charm. Blasting down the highway to avenge sevenfolds blinded in chains or dropping the leap of faith while listening to Rage Against the Machine's Guerrilla Radio is just so much fun. Besides that, it is also a great tool for making a game more accessible to the player. I used to have a hard time getting into Forza Horizon 3, but when I realized what an amazing radio station Epitaph Radio is, I couldn't stop racing through the rainforest at 400 km an hour while the radio blasted one awesome metal song after the other. Alright, so the big question is, why are video game soundtracks so relevant? I mean, it is pretty obvious that, for us humans, music is an incredibly relevant part of our culture. We listen to music while on the bus, we sing to each other to celebrate or to soothe us, and we have a more or less mutually shared concept of sad, happy or daunting music. This of course depends on who you ask to name a song's feel. Western and Eastern cultures oftentimes have different perceptions of sad and happy music, but that's not relevant right now. Although the real world is full of music, it is often also absent, yet the situations we find ourselves in stay highly emotional. The birth of a child, the sudden death of a grandparent, or the deceit of a loved one usually don't have fitting background music. But we are in there, directly involved and exposed to all the input we see or hear. And that's when we feel. When emotions develop and our body reacts. But what happens when you cannot physically be there? Some people will get emotional very easily. They fall in love, adore or hate characters in no time and have no problem displaying their fiction-based emotions in the real world. Others need a little bit more help though. 
They are emotionally attached to the characters, sure, but they understand that the situation is absolutely heartbreaking, but their reaction is nothing more than a shrug, a short, <laughs> or just indifference. It's not like they don't want to feel with the characters, at least that's what I think, but they just can't. And that's where soundtracks come in. Soundtracks bridge the gap between real-life emotions and in-game situations. Even the most insensitive person can be brought to emotions when presented with the right combination of music, scenery, storytelling and gameplay. It has gotten so far that I find situations in games where there is no music playing highly irritating and more immersion breaking than situations where there is music playing, even though, compared to the real world, music blasting from invisible speakers over the protagonist's head is super unnatural. It does depend on the game, because games that usually don't have free roam music, except for cars like Far Cry or GTA, are not as irritating when they stop playing music as games that soothe you with their scores 24-7 like RPGs or platforms. Timing is a big factor here. Usually at the start of an important cutscene or while switching areas in the game world, the appropriate songs from the OST start playing and are, if necessary, cut to fit the situation as well as possible. But some cutscenes, especially cutscenes, don't repeat or start a new piece when you activate them. So it sometimes happens that the music fades out during a cutscene and the characters stand there in awkward silence until you choose a dialogue option or the voice actor starts talking again. This is not a big deal, but still confusing in a way, as it breaks the immersion instantly. Bugs, and I know that music stopping in a cutscene is not necessarily a bug, are huge immersion breakers. You immediately ask yourself, hey, why did the music stop? Well, let me put the audio slider to zero and back to 100 to restart the music. Ah, oh, I can't pause the game because I'm in the dialogue and ah, uh, god damn it. In most games, there are special themes for specific characters, places and gameplay elements. Most of those themes are not just pieces of music that fit the game world quite well, but have hidden messages written in a musical code by the composer. They tell you what you can expect from this person, place or situation. Let's look at a few examples. Whenever I write an analysis, and this is my fourth one, I stumble across The Witcher 3. Whenever I have something great to say about how video games or video game soundtracks are made, endless examples from Wild Hunt pop into my head. I then try to think of other examples from other games, because I don't want to bore you with ever the same content. But you know what? The Witcher 3 is the best game ever made, as I told you guys in my analysis already. And that's why I'll keep using it as an example. After the introducing dream, Geralt and Vesemir start riding through the game's first proper part of the world, White Orchard. This part of the Witcher's world is mostly designed as an example, a tutorial of what's ahead. There are forests, small hills, a village, a lake, a river, everything you will come across in your journey across the northern realms and to song. But the soundtrack tells you even more. It has deep and soft strings, soothing your minds and calming you down. The sun is shining down on you, birds are chirping, and you feel like this is a quiet, a peaceful place. But as you ride through the fields, bodies are hanging from gallows, crows eating their eyes, people crying next to their destroyed huts searching for the loved ones. Higher pitched sounds cry into your ears, wailing over war that has cost too many lives in these lands. The soundtrack tells you, this is a quiet place, but it's no peaceful place. You will meet fear, poverty and despair. This world may seem to have its good sides, but don't be fooled. Your journey will be difficult. I think that once you realize what is hidden behind a game's soundtrack, you can enjoy the game even more. That may require you to, in some way, analyze the soundtrack, realize the underlying structures of where the pieces play and what they might mean in the situation. Some might say that it takes the magic out of the music, but I feel like once I get to know a soundtrack, I start to recognize themes and callbacks that are not only hidden in the visuals and the story, but also in the soundtrack. And that just expands my experience even further. I know that all of this stuff is pretty vague, that I'm talking about underlying structures and hidden meanings, it's a bit like poetry back in school. Why did the author choose to describe the curtains as blue? Is it because of his deep admiration for the sea? Or was it the favorite color of his beloved wife? 
Usually my answer to that was he chose blue because either he just liked blue or because the curtains were fucking blue. <laughs> and now look at me, eight years later, talking about hidden meanings and messages myself. Even if you don't agree with me on this, you can't deny that soundtracks built the game world. Even if we dismiss all the emotional, feely stuff, it still bridges the gap between reality and illusion. Think about the US Midwest. Rolling fields, mountains high in the sky, the bright sun warming your skin, the smell of a summer's day in your nose. Two of those four sensations you can see in a game. But what about the sun on your skin? A scent in your nose? As long as we don't have smell-supported games, we need another sensation to fill the gap. So cue the strings and a banjo, a guitar and some light bass. You can feel the heat through the music, the heavy air of a summer's day in your nose, and the peace of mind in your heart. This is Now That This Old World Is Ending, Dan Romer's masterful Far Cry 5 theme. Suddenly, it's getting colder. There's a strong wind pulling on your hair, the smell of salt and fish in your nose. The people around you are wearing thick fur coats, withstanding the forces of nature troubling them each day. They speak in a harsh but still friendly manner and welcome each traveler who anchors in their port. Welcome to Art Skellig. This piece, named after Skellig's main island, is one of the tracks that are not on the official soundtrack of The Witcher 3. And how this incredible wonder of immersion was considered not to be worthy of that honor is a complete mystery to me. You see, OSTs not only give the player a chance to emphasize with the characters, but also to describe the world they are in. They take the place of sensations otherwise hidden from you because of the limitations of our current technology. I would even go as far as to say that the OSTs alone carry enough meaning and depth that they can make you see the world the game is set in, without giving you any visuals. This is mostly due to culture, regional Pacific instruments and singing, but it still works. Here, let's try. Listen to these four pieces and try to find out in what kind of world you'd hear this music. Pretty much every game that has an element of fighting or conflict has a specific theme for the conflict. Boss themes or fight themes are usually high beats per minute and energetic to motivate the player and put them on the edge. Here are a few examples.
these messages stay hidden for most of the players. Or let's not just say hidden, but rather hidden in plain sight. There's so much to interpret into a game's soundtrack that I could make hour-long videos about some game's soundtracks themselves, but that's not what we're here for. Many players just experience the soundtracks. They accept them as present and like or dislike them, but nothing more. This is perfectly fine, and I'm definitely not saying that I'm some kind of musical expert who immediately recognizes all the deep and hidden meanings behind a soundtrack. Quite the opposite, actually. I can't even read sheet music. But it saddens me how many people dismiss OSTs or, god forbid, turn them off completely. I don't want to tell them how to enjoy their games. If they'll like it that way, please go ahead. But I'll never be able to understand how one cannot see those masterpieces for what they are. I make use of these concepts myself when I produce my videos. The Witcher analysis started out with a longer version of the Camorn theme. I showed Geralt standing on Camorn's balcony and I talked about how much I love this game. Next, I contrasted that with a big colorful title card and the trail blasting in the background. I did that so my viewers knew that there's a shift in style and tone coming. At the end of the video, I used the growing tension in Geralt of Rivia, The Witcher 3's main piece, to give more impact to what I'm saying. I concluded all that I have talked about and left the viewer with the climax of the song and a compilation of clips from the game. In my match analysis, I used the same music and imagery in the beginning and at the end of the video to frame the content and give a sense of no way out. And in my Wild of Video Games video, I used Fallout 4's cinematic intro to achieve some sense of drama and urgency. I always get confused when I ask people which kind of music they like, and they just say charts or radio. I don't belittle or shame them, I just don't understand. Music is a universal connector, a language you can understand without learning it. It just wants you to listen, to try to understand, and that may require you to think about it for a second, to recognize it for what it is. I know, some of you might say that this is an overanalyzing or useless, but trust me, you will find something. Something drawing you in, reminding you of a place, a feeling, or a thought. Something that is more than just music.